der Keynote, Sie haben schon angesprochen, Marion Marschalek, Scaling Security works on my machine, doesn't work on your machine. Wir werden gemeinsam einen Blick auf Sicherheitsprobleme werfen, wie können wir dagegen vorgehen, welche Rolle spielt Machine Learning und Artificial Intelligence. Ich darf somit übergeben. Einen großen Applaus bitte. Dankeschön. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the keynote about scaling security. You just heard that I'm an alumni of the school, and I hear that a lot of you are wondering why the hell is she speaking English? Well, let me tell you, there is a simple reason for that. Um, I've been a public speaker for a good 10 years now. I have not given a presentation in German in nine years. And trust me, after living in the United States for six years, I do not speak proper German anymore. <laughs> that is why we're having a keynote in English this year. And as you've heard earlier, I work for a very large cloud provider, that is AWS. And you might imagine that we know a lot about scaling. That is why today we're talking about scaling security. Um, works on my machine doesn't work on your machine, refers to the phenomenon that whenever you use someone's third-party code, you might find functionality in that code that you haven't been prepared for, that you were not expecting to be in there. Um, and that is what we'll be talking about today. First of all, let me see this clicker. It works. Awesome. All right. Who am I? Again, my name is Marion. I'm a senior security engineer for AWS, and I work with a team of machine learning scientists and developers. We develop threat detection technologies. My team is named GuardDuty, so if you use the cloud and you activate GuardDuty, that is my work that is in this product. Before I joined AWS, I worked for Intel in microarchitectural security. I was in the Intel Storm team working in offensive security, so I have minuscular experience in exploiting microarchitectural bugs. Before that, I spent six years in the threat detection technology. That means I worked in antivirus, I worked in incident response, and yeah, what brought me there was the school. I graduated from the Fachhochschule St. Pölten. In 2011, I was one of the students of the first class of this school educated, and I am so very proud and happy to be back here today. I cannot imagine. Also, the last thing about this slide about me, I need to tell you that I do not speak for my employer and the opinions I present are my own. Of course. All right, let's get started. Um, so again, I graduated here in 2011. Back then, the security field was so different. It seemed simpler. As we heard earlier, we used to think that the attackers that are bugging us are script keys that sit in the basement. They're 14 years old. They write malware. Then they send out the malware, and that malware is what steals money from our bank accounts. Lo and behold, there is barely any more malware that steals money from bank accounts. Banking trojans have kind of died out because the attackers found out that they can more easily make money with ransomware. You all have heard of ransomware? That is a great cash cow. The fact that today people who write malware can make a lot of money has changed the security field so much. If you're a security professional, you work on the payroll, you receive a monthly salary. Now guess what? Those guys writing the ransomware, they are on a payroll as well. They do their job for money. People writing exploits do their job for money. People finding bugs in software do their job for money. People um, preparing denial of service attacks do their job for money. State-sponsored attackers um, do their job for money. People who perform targeted attacks do their job for money. So the industry has changed fundamentally in the sense that now we have people on both sides who are actively being paid for doing their work, which is an inter sorry, interesting constellation. And that makes this beautiful bubble of words that I put on the slide here. Again, preparing this, I noticed that security has changed. It is 2023, and today we speak about hardware vulnerabilities, we speak about state-sponsored actors, we speak about cyber warfare, we speak about supply chain attacks, 
None of that was really prevalent back in the day when I graduated. And as the security field has changed, the work on the defender side to protect networks, to protect hospitals, to protect credit card information, to protect power grids, to protect political securities has changed as well. Interestingly, for most of the words in the slide, I have stories from my past. I've been in this industry for 15 years. Um, there isn't much in security that you haven't seen in 15 years. And as such, let's dive into some topics in security that I picked out as particularly interesting of all that is on this slide. But first of all, let's talk about something boring. It's always good to start off the talks with the boring things because then later people are really, really relieved that the talk got more, um, you know, interesting. So the boring things. Um, IBM puts out a breach report every year where they analyze how expensive breaches are. You know this again, security has become an economy of income and payment and as such, companies have started to calculate um, how expensive would it be if I got breached? Honestly, I didn't read the full report. It's about 23 pages big. There's a link on the bottom of the slide, like right down here if you're interested. You can fetch that report. I've picked out the most interesting bits of that report. Namely, it says that breaches get more expensive, which, of course, if attackers can grab more secrets and cause more damage, that's what it will be. Um, but also, that same report, among other things, said that 51% of organizations want to invest more money um, into different fields, including threat detection and response. Also, the report says that organizations that use security automation and AI um, lower their average cost of a breach. Um, what does it mean for, well, for me personally, I work on the team that works on exactly those topics, which is great. So my job is secure, but for us, as a security industry means that those are the topics that we should be focusing on moving forward in order to make this world a safer place. And again, this is what this presentation will focus on. But did you say LLM? <laughs> um, <laughs> if you saw the abstract I provided, you might have seen that I put in there that LLMs can solve all the problems. I still believe that. Um, first of all, what is an LLM? If you've ever used ChatGPT, then you have also used what is called a large language model. Large language models are amazing. They're very powerful. They're also very expensive. They're difficult to train. And um, yeah, in fact, if you want all the details about LLMs and large language models, sorry, about ChatGPT, the best approach to learn about it is to ask ChatGPT itself. I personally need to disclaim, I am not a machine learning scientist. I work with those folk, but I do not understand their algorithms very well. I do understand, however, part of my job is to tell them whether a certain approach works on a given problem that we face or not. And something interesting I found asking ChatGPT about ChatGPT is that it told me that it generates responses based on patterns in the text data it was trained on. That is a very important point. If we want to understand whether machine learning works in security, it is important to embrace this fact if we cannot train the model on the data that represents the thing that we want to find. We cannot actually find the thing that we want to find. What does it mean? Well, if we want to find anomalies in security logs, then those logs need to contain the actual anomalies. And I will dive deeper into the topic later in this presentation. It also brings us to the point, though, why can't we solve all security problems with LLM and be done with it? I kid you not, I've been asked this question so many times. Um, relatively simple, LLM is trained on very large quantities of curated data. If you look around the security space, we do not have very large quantities of curated data. There is data sets that are available. We can use those for training and testing. Those data sets that are available online for research are almost never exactly the data sets that you need to solve your specific problem. And again, I'll get back to that problem, uh, to that, yeah, to that training problem later in this presentation. 
but keep in mind OLMs are sadly not the solution for all security problems. We first need to find a way to put the security problem we're looking at into a large curated data set. And from there, we could take the model away. All right. Took that out of the way. Great. Um, let's get back to security problems. So I mentioned I picked a different um, modern day security problems to talk about today. One of them that I'm personally very much like is denial of service attacks. Years ago, denial of service attacks was something, again, that script kitties started from botnets that they had rented and they were attacking game servers. Two years ago, I saw an interesting blog post that started out with, congratulations, now you too can be part of the Ukraine war. I found that line very catching, um, particularly because I didn't want to be part of the Ukraine war, but also because I didn't understand how cybersecurity and that war fit together. But now years later, and since I'm a malware specialist, of course I understand better, um, distributed denial of service attacks are not used anymore only to attack game servers. They can also be used to attack infrastructure. They can attack power grids, they can attack TV stations, they can attack informational websites, they can attack campaigns of political opponents, and as such, they have become from interesting phenomena to an actual global problem. The, well, my, so to speak, if there were a favorite denial service attack uh, of the couple, past couple of years, that would be the distributed denial service attack that was connected on a DNS provider that's named DIN. Most of you probably have never heard of DIN. Um, I hadn't either until this attack happened. That was in 2016. And the way we noticed that DIN was down was because a lot of services were down. Um, that is among other reasons, because DNS, the uh, domain name service, is deeply ingrained in the, the backbone of the internet. You might know without naming services, we cannot um, reach websites, but also naming services are used uh, in coordination inside of networks. And that turned out to be a big problem. After that, now service attack and then was started, a long list of services that we all use and love were not available. That attack lasted for only a couple of hours, um, but it became clear, among other things, to legislators that this is a real problem that the world needs to deal with. You see on this list, there is companies on there like Spotify, Slack, Silo, Airbnb, HBO, et cetera, et cetera. And most impressively, this list is very long. So there was one DNS provider, and taking out that one provider affected this many services. Now you can imagine that these attacks at scale are a problem that we as a security industry need to pay big attention to. What was interesting about this was the attack was conducted by a botnet that was named Mirai. Mirai is a very prevalent denial of service bot. Um, I know that because those bots are trying to attack AWS machines as well, um, but computers or cloud instances are not the prime target for those bots. The prime target for those bots are your home routers and your home automation systems. Jeez, your security camera might be running a bot right now, you don't know. That's a big problem because those systems are not prepared for attacks. I don't know, raise your hands. Who runs antivirus on their router? Nobody. Not, not saying that antivirus would necessarily detect the, the bot once it gets there, but again, there's no line of defense on devices that so far people haven't talked about. Um, if you've kept up with security news the last couple of years, IoT, um, Internet of Things devices, were a big topic. The, they are a big problem because of the blatant lack of security. And among other things, legislators have jumped into that topic and they're starting to draft policies to protect those devices better. Let's move on. Supply chain security. <laughs> Another really, really nice topic if you work in security. Um, all of you have mobile phones, all of you have computers, 
All of you have CPUs in those devices. All of you, maybe not all of you, some of you have security cameras. Some of you have um, some digital assistant device that's sitting around home. All of those devices run hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of pieces of software that you did not inspect. And I'm telling you, nobody did. Supply chain security refers to, we have used somebody else's software to build this thing, and we have no idea what it does. Interestingly, this is not a new problem. I put a quote on the slide from a very well-known um, computer scientist named Ken Thompson. Ken Thompson was one of the original founders of the Unix operating system. And he received a Turing Award in 1984. 1984. Some of us were not on this planet by that time, including myself. Um, when he received his Turing Award in 1984, he gave a presentation titled Reflections on Trusting Trust. This presentation was about a compiler plugin. He was modifying a compiler to produce a different piece of output than what was intended by the person writing the source code. I was very inspired by this presentation by Ken Thompson. Um, when I was working at Intel, my job was to build plugins for the GCC compiler. And it is phenomenal what you can do with a compiler that the source code did not tell the compiler to do. It is not difficult. It is fairly practical. It is a great way of attacking. People look at source code, don't find a bug. People look at the binary, and all of a sudden, there is a vulnerability in there. There is a backdoor in there. There might be a whole Trojan hidden in there, and God, who knows? Nobody ever inspects their compiler. It was also a fabulous way to do security research. Um, at the time, Ken Thompson said that perhaps it is important to trust the people who wrote the software. And again, all of you run software on one or another device that you are trusting whether you know it or not. For the industry, this problem became very clear when a big bomb hit in 2022. I think that was 2022. Who in the room has heard about solar winds? Who in the room has heard about solar winds before 2022? A few hands. There you see what I'm talking about. So SolarWinds is a software provider that builds, um, yeah, I'm not sure I actually know what software they build. It's management software that, among other things, is used by the um, US government a lot, and also a lot of very large companies around the globe. They operate internationally, and so their software was in a lot of computer networks. Ad techers found out about that and thought that SolarWinds software would be a great vehicle to distribute their malicious software into other people's networks. And it worked surprisingly well. Through the SolarWinds attack, the ad techers managed to backdoor 18,000 customers, 18,000 people through one hack. The hack itself was very complex. What they did was not an easy thing. They breached the company. They made sure they leave no trace in their network. They subverted the build system. They managed to sneak code into that build system and make the build system put that code into the update package that SolarWinds then distributed to their customers. This, in the end, was what allowed attackers to gain access to those customer machines. It was very carefully crafted. They did proper error checking. Most importantly, they cleaned up their traces. So they cleaned up logs that were gathered in the company that could have helped them detect the attack and later on analyze the attack. One of the people who worked on that incident was later interviewed by Wired, the computer security magazine, and he called it sheer elegance. And I can nothing but agree. It was very elegant. It was very crafty and extremely powerful. Something interesting about that attack that I found personally as a malware analyst that the attackers waited after their, their backdoor became active in the customer network for 12 to 14 days. You cannot imagine if you're an attacker how powerful it is to sometimes just wait. Because most detection technologies are actually focusing on a very short frame in time. 
They look at something once and then never again. They do not measure effects over a period of time. And so attackers who did this knew about it and leveraged that to evade detection for even longer. Now, scared much. <laughs> um, I am, I tell you honestly, because again, we are on software that we haven't inspected. And um, I can tell you this anecdote about five years ago, I was working at Intel and in one project, I was reviewing firmware code. Firmware code is what runs in the very core of your computer. If you have a CPU, there's like memory on there and there's another little CPU that sits on the CPU. That's where firmware is executed. And you would think that people take care when you write the firmware, and they do. There is a lot of processes that make sure that that firmware is secure. But so, manually looking at that firmware code, I can tell you, it is impossible as a human in one lifetime to read the full source code of the firmware that runs on your CPU. It is virtually impossible. So what do we do to create secure code, which turns out as secure binaries? We run automatic checks. We run software that looks for vulnerabilities, that looks for bugs. We test the output binary, we fuzz them, we turn them inside out, we look what's on top, what's on the bottom, what's inside, to figure out is there anything that changed in the binary that shouldn't be. And still, we cannot find all the problems that we have in software. Now what do we do? One more case that I wanted to talk to you about before I talk about how to detect those problems. A very recent case. Some of you might have seen, it was big in the news. Microsoft, one of the biggest software companies in the world, lost a signing key. I know for a fact that there is a class at the school about digital signatures. So you all know what I'm talking about when I say signing key, which is wonderful. And those signing keys can be very powerful. In this case, it was a customer signing key, which is differentiated from an enterprise signing key, which is a big difference. So that the customer signing key can be used to sign authentication tokens, which eventually allowed attackers access to Outlook accounts. Through different problems um, throughout this hack, which I'll talk about in a minute. But there was a specific bug in the API that Microsoft used to verify the security tokens, which allowed attackers to use that customer signing key to access enterprise email accounts, which was the actual big issue with this hack. So with a simple key, attackers again were able to access um, large corporations' email accounts, government offices' email accounts, and so on and so forth. Um, very bad on the Microsoft side. What happened though? How did those attackers get to this very important signing key? It turns out um, Microsoft actually did a great job in analyzing this specific incident and publishing the details of this incident, which from the security engineering side I find very, very um, impressive. There's nothing better for us to learn how to protect against those cases than companies talking about how things happened. And that's what Microsoft did. There's a very cool blog post about it again, and I posted the link at the bottom of the slide. Um, what happened was, at Microsoft, they have a very secure production environment. Signing keys only live in production environments. If you've never worked for a software company or any larger organization, we separate things. We love to separate things so that people who debug things don't work on customer production accounts, and people who work in production accounts don't actually lose things that then go free in debugging environments. And this is still the problem that happened at Microsoft. A signing system in the production environment crashed. And as Microsoft does, they look into crashes. So they pull the crash dump of that machine, including the signing key that was on the machine. And as you would think, there is a system that looks through crash dumps before they leave the production environment um, to see whether there's any key material in that crash dump and that check failed. The check did not notice that there was a, a signing key in the crash dump. And so the crash dump was extracted, 
and was put into the debugging environment where then engineers could go and debug and see why the machine crashed. The crash had nothing to do with the key, by the way. Um, but so that happened. And then the crash dump with the key was sitting around there. Again, the security scanner did not find that key. There's two different stages where it could have um, and did not. The other thing that happened was that some developer's computer was compromised by an attacker. That developer did not have access to the production account, but that developer had access to the debug environment. And that's what must have happened. Um, personal interpretation. Attackers don't usually know that there's keys in crash terms, but they probably did suspect that there might be something interesting in that data. I assume that attackers who, who breached that computer were really just looking for a large dump of data, and crash dumps are always interesting. So they gathered those crash dumps that they found in the debug environment and started looking. And I don't know how they were looking or whether they really were specifically looking for a signing key, but they did find that signing key in the crash dump. And as such, they got their hands on the signing key. Then again, there was an API flaw that allowed them to use that key to access enterprise accounts, and this is how this, this hack became so big. All right, now we talked about all the big security problems. Of course, there weren't all of them, but we don't have time forever. And that is why now we switch um, to the detection side. This is what I'm actually working on in practice. And we'll start this off with a very brief instruction, uh, introduction to threat detection. It turns out threat detection is in reality a very simple mechanism. That is, we look for the malicious thing. <clears throat> We look for the malicious thing, and then we try to find that malicious thing in the benign thing. So we have a bit of attacker information, and we look for that in the benign data. That's how it works. Simple, showing that in pictures. This is a hex stamp of a piece of malware. It's a Bitcoin miner. And in there, you see strings that are very indicative, like URL of mining server. Of course, that's a Bitcoin miner. Let's put that into a pattern. Let's say this is a, an antivirus signature now. We use that to scan anything. Next, though, we find out that this is actual source code that was documented in some security blog, and somebody talked about this Bitcoin miner showing exactly that string, and all of a sudden, we scan somebody's computer that has cached this website, and boom, we have a false positive because we didn't use the right string. All right, this is how threat detection worked. 30 years ago, and honestly, it still does today. Now what do we do? We look again, we change the signature, we make it bigger. Now that we catch a lot of data in the signature, of course we can detect the binary that we want to find, and maybe not the website. And in reality, there are so many ways to prevent this specific false positive. I'm just using this as an example. But so you get the, the gist of it, we have a signature, we make sure that signature only hits the malicious thing. And this is where the cat and mouse game starts. Next, the attacker comes along and puts a runtime packer on the binary. Then we don't know what we're looking at anymore, our signature doesn't match anymore. And from there, we move along. This is how it all starts. So we have a security pattern, and we look for that security pattern in the thing that we want to scan. We do not want to find the benign data, we want to find the malicious data. We find the malicious data, the attacker finds out, changes the malicious data, and we gotta go back and change the signature again, and the attacker changes the binary again, then they come up with something smarter, then we have to come up with something smarter as well, then we find indicators of compromise, then we find threat intelligence, then we have all these different patterns that we're looking for, and attackers are very busy trying to evade those patterns. And this is what we look like um, across the threat detection industry. Doesn't matter whether we're looking for active attackers in our network, we look at patterns in the network traffic, or in our AWS account, we look for odd API calls that aren't usually authorized at a certain time of day or something like that. And um, yeah, the cat and mouse game from the beginning when I started, I started out as an antivirus engineer. Like I was one of those kids sitting in a lab creating signatures looking at those patterns and trying to find the malicious ones, 15 years later, we still do the same thing. We look for a pattern, and we try to find that pattern in data. 
Nothing has changed, except now we make more money. Um, that brings me to this slide. This is like my favorite slide. Um, have you ever seen the O'Reilly books? That was really, really um, prevalent on, on Twitter for a while. And it turns out there's a meme generator. If you want to generate your own O'Reilly books, that's totally a thing. And the quote I put on, on this picture is something I heard a long time ago, that the attackers didn't follow the rules we made up. I, I showed that to my coworkers, that, that specific quote, in, in a regular interval, because as security engineers, um, we tend to think that this one thing that we see, this malicious thing, works on my machine, great. And we think that that works on everybody else's machine as well. That could be signatures, that could be indicators of compromise, that could be threat intelligence. In fact, this is all the same things. They've just changed names over time. We have detection rules. We also do have patches and mitigations. I'll be talking about mitigations in a minute as well. Um, we come up with those solutions for what we see as a problem. And we build those solutions in a lab, in a small network, and then we hope that those solutions work out there in the big bad world as well, and oftentimes that fails. Let's look at that a little closer. How many of you have worked with VirusTotal before? Awesome, a lot of hands. VirusTotal is like my favorite tool, not necessarily because it tells me whether something is malware or not, that doesn't always work so well, but because it allows you to observe the behavior of antivirus scanners, which is great. Um, coming out of the antivirus industry, of course, I love that. And here on the screen, you see virus total where one vendor flags a piece of software. That piece of software is ransomware. That ransomware was written by me. I went to my lab. I wrote a little piece of malware. I took out the malicious bits. Like, I'm not actually encrypting files. I'm also not actually leaving ransomware notes. Um, but there's no strings in there. So I uploaded the binary, and immediately, one scanner tells me this is a variant of Linux file coder, which sounds ransomware enough. However, none of the others picks up on that information. What gets interesting now is if I come back a day later, which I did, or two days, apologies, a day later, two days later, and I rescan the file, all of a sudden, many, many engines hit the file. And you know what happened? They didn't go and analyze that sample. They analyzed other people's detections. So sometimes for those detections, there isn't an analyst sitting in a lab creating a pattern to match. But sometimes there's engines learning from other engines. There's security vendors learning from other vendors. And that is completely benign. That is absolutely OK. That has happened almost since the beginning of antivirus. People share information, and that is great. This way, this information travels faster than if there were humans in the loop that need to be looking at those samples. It also tells us, though, that mistakes travel faster if anybody makes one. In this case, they are all detecting ransomware that's not actually ransomware. Um, we shall forgive them, though, because it looked ransomware enough. But this whole mechanism of sharing is caring, in the past also created problems. Specifically, there was an interesting case of a false positive spread that came from VirusTotal specifically. You might know that those vendors, they learn from VirusTotal. VirusTotal shares files that you upload there. By the way, if you ever upload anything secret to VirusTotal, it lands in my lab. So don't do that. How that works for, vi for VirusTotal false positives? Um, there's an interesting report on there. I forgot to put the link, but if you're interested, you can ask me later. Um, an interesting report about Microsoft's anti-malware research lab getting a lot of false positives because they learned from VirusTotal. And we're not talking about a few here and there. We're talking about swaths and swaths of false positives. It just so happened that somebody had stuffed VirusTotal. So they had uploaded a large amount of samples to VirusTotal that were malicious code interleaved with benign code. So imagine you have um, a printer driver, and that printer driver contains marks of malicious software. What happened was that antivirus companies, and I believe not only Microsoft, but others as well, 
downloaded those samples because they were detected as malicious on VirusTotal, they trusted that result, and then used those samples to create their own signatures. Again, there isn't a human sitting there. There's most likely some automated tool sitting there extracting patterns and using those as signatures for the malware that they're looking at. Except in those cases, they were not looking at malware. They were looking at half benign, half malicious samples. And it just so turns out that the signatures they created from those samples were actually hitting benign code. Now, some of those vendors rolled those out and created swaths and swaths of false positives, which is exactly what those attackers tried to achieve. That is evil, but it is understandable how this works if the industry is relying on those ways of automation. And that is another big problem that we see in security, especially if we're relying on pattern matching so much, is that one mistake that sneaks into the system replicates and eventually creates a big, big problem. Next topic, <laughs> mitigations. I love those. When I was at Intel, the reason why I was working on compilers was I was drafting mitigations. And you wouldn't believe how hard it is to write an exploit mitigation. It is so much easier to write the actual exploit. Anyhow, if you're ever interested, compilers are a very interesting field of research. What I wanted to point out there here is one specific paper, a publication that described how to exploit a stack buffer overflow. That was the very first paper that actually described it in detail and provided an exploit with it as well. It is called Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit. That was written by a hacker named LF1 27 years ago. Keep that number in mind. Think about that number deeply. Because the next thing I'll put in the slide is data from 2023, where Citrix, which is not a small software product, just put out a patch to fix a stack-based buffer overflow in their software. Um, for this topic, I was looking for a demonstration of how slow the security industry can be. And I was stunned that we knew 27 years ago that stack-based buffer overflows are a problem. We have produced fixes for this. We have stack canaries. We have non-executable memory. We have detections that can tell us whether a stack has been compromised. And none of those fixes made it into Citrix. Citrix is not a small product. It is out there. 2023 is now. This has happened a few months ago. 27 years ago, we knew this is a problem, and we still haven't fixed it. However, we have come up with a long list of mitigations. I couldn't fit all of them on the slide. I had to stop. There's so many mitigations. There's mitigations for CPUs. There's mitigations for operating systems. There's specific mitigations for specific software. There's people like me sitting in labs writing mitigations, testing mitigations, developing mitigations. There is no end to it. Um, and we still have software vulnerabilities. We still have exploitable stack-based buffer overflows. It breaks my brain. If you look at a long list, some of those are really revolutionary. Actually, if you look into the uh, exploit development process nowadays, finding the bug is one thing. Um, getting to the bug is another thing actually triggering the bug. Um, exploiting that bug, however, is made so much harder by the wealth of mitigations that need to be bypassed. Um, something else that we did at Intel was um, experimenting with kernel exploits. What I learned there was that the biggest challenge in exploiting a kernel bug after you found it is bypassing all the mitigations that are now in the security product, uh, sorry, in the operating system. And the thing that that told me, unfortunately, is that, again, there's people out there, like researchers in a lab, like offensive researchers, attackers, criminals, who are being paid to go bypass security mitigations. So there's people developing the mitigations, and then there's people making the bunny their money um, bypassing those mitigations. And that is a very, very interesting field. One of the points there to note is um, not just criminals pay money for security vulnerabilities. Sometimes companies themselves pay money for that as well. 
Um, something that hasn't existed as well when I graduated here is bug bunnies. Bug bunnies are interesting in the sense that companies offer attackers money for their own vulnerabilities. Microsoft offers as much as 100,000 US dollars if somebody submits a proof of concept for a bug that they found in the Microsoft product. $100,000. That is not a bad annual salary um, to start with. And imagine you write two of those, it's $200,000 a year. You can live on that. There's a lot of those programs out there. Um, unfortunately, I, ha I have no list of that, but if you're interested, a lot of big companies nowadays offer bug bunnies, and it is not a bad career path to go and look for bugs for a living. Of course, these submissions must be reliable, reasonable, impactful, and so on and so forth. So every company will have a list of requirements for those specific exploits that they want to see. But again, there's an economy for that out there. All right. So what works on my machine doesn't work on your machine. Signatures are broken. They don't scale. Um, mitigations are being bypassed with people who really have a lot of interest in bypassing those. Security vulnerabilities are still out there. We had not fixed that. So what do we do as a security industry? Of course, we go bigger. We couldn't find the needle, so we made the haystack bigger. That is one of the mottos we have in cybersecurity driven by machine learning. Um, the more data, the better. Let's see what that means. What does scale even mean? Before you've worked in the cloud, um, let me tell you, you don't really understand what scale actually means. Scale means millions of instances. It means customers with different operating systems, with different CPUs. It means different devices, products with different purposes. It means different uptimes. It means different geolocations. It means different political environments. It means different limitations on data that can be observed on the system. It means that whatever we do in a security product needs to be as simple as possible, and we need to do that thing as good as we can. Scaling the complex things doesn't work. Um, in the past, I've worked with students a lot. Students have this habit of making the thing pretty. Like, the more that's in that project, the better. The, the more shiny the solution is, the better. In the cloud, we do exactly the opposite. We try to build it as simple as possible so that it scales. And the other thing I learned working in the cloud is that the corner cases always happen. If you look at a solution and you think that this is perfect, except for that one little problem. That one little problem always comes back to haunt you. It just might so happened that in the past I looked at, an, at a system that was supposed to automatically extract signatures from binaries. And that system would find the location for where to extract those patterns from the binary in an automated manner. And I had this conversation with the engineer who built this and asked him, so if it automatically looks for that location, how do we know that that location actually has relevant data? Remember, if you want to build signatures, we want to have the malicious part in the signature and not the benign part. So I asked that specific question, and he said that it's just very, very unlikely the way the algorithm works that we find those benign patterns because the algorithm. And at the time, it was not in my power to stop that product from hitting the market, and it did, and within three days, we found the first false positive because the algorithm had not made the right decision. And of course it wasn't. There was a corner case. And of course that system hit the corner case. But what do we do in order to scale? And there's a long list of things at the bottom of the slide, um, which I don't mean for you to read. Just look at the long list. There's so many things that we can do to make these systems work better, to make these systems scale. And this, in fact, here in the bottom, is my job description. And I'll get back to that list on the next slide, where I talk about the paradigm of threat detection at scale. What do I mean there? 
if I'm sitting in my lab and we're building something like a new product, we have goals, mighty goals. We want to detect threats, all of them. We want to prevent attackers from exploiting a system. We want to prevent malware from running at the system. We want to prevent people who are on the command line from executing scripts that are malicious. We want to stop web shells from being popped. We want to spread, stop um, web services from being compromised. We want to stop backdoors and software from being shipped. We want to inspect all the third party dependencies of our products and make sure they're secure, and so on and so forth. So there's a big goal right there. We want high coverage. Classical antivirus runs on a computer. Nowadays, we don't just have computers anymore. We have computers, and we have phones, and we have devices that sit on the kitchen counter. We have readers. We have security cameras. We have cloud instances. We have load balancers. We have code building systems. We have different items that we might be able to reach or we might not. One of those problems with coverage is that if we're on those devices, uh, some of those that I just listed, we might not always have access to the data we actually want to scan. If you're on a high, uh, high use server and your idea is to inspect the live memory to see what processes are running and what is happening on the machine at runtime, you might run into that problem that you are not fast enough to collect all the data, inspect all the data, and produce um, detections for that data in time because of the amount of data you're looking at. That is a limitation that is very real. Um, and again, working for a cloud provider, that is a very significant problem. High performance. If you have used a computer, say, 10, 15 years ago, you had antivirus installed on there. Have you ever noticed that the computer is a little slower than it should actually be? That was a big problem. The problem is still there. And it is being worked on. Those detection mechanisms, no matter whether they look for malware or whether they look for malicious patterns on the network, on the wire, or whether they look for indicators of compromise in a computer network, um, none of those can be slow. There's never endless amounts of times. And as such, we aim for high performance. Also, of course, no false positives. What is interesting about false positives is it's not necessarily that this false positive pops up um, on the customer box. That's a big issue. But the time that customers put into following up on false positives, there's something called alert fatigue. So engineers like yourself might be sitting there looking at those alarms that come in from your SIEM system, from your antivirus, from whatever you use for monitoring the network, from looking for vulnerabilities in software. And after looking into, let me make up a number, 200 cases that did not result in an actual detected attack or problem, you stop looking. You do not follow up every of those alerts because you don't care anymore. And this is when the big attacks happen. If engineers are fatigued from too many alerts, then we might detect the attack, but nobody cares anymore. Nobody looks. And that has happened so many times in the past in the security industry. Some of the biggest hacks in history have happened because alerts were not significant enough. A product needs to be cost effective. If you build at scale, you cannot build the most shiny Ferrari because nobody wants to pay that kind of money. Of course, there's different levels of security needs. There's different systems that need more protection than some others might. So there might be some customers who are willing to pay the big dollar amounts for a specific product. But in reality, nobody really wants security until they have a problem. So the budgets don't usually grow bigger unless there is an incident. But of course, we don't wish anybody an incident. Just saying, we need to be cost effective and prioritized. Again, alert fatigue is a real problem, and priorities matter. Now, what do we do on the engineering side to achieve that type of scaling? We do more. We collect more logs. We want more visibility. 
Visibility is key. If we can't look at the data that contains the indicators, we cannot find the indicators. So you need to be able to look. We need more threat intelligence that usually we either produce ourselves or we buy from a third party. That's usually how it works. We need more signatures. It means more people in the labs sitting there looking at threat data and coming up with those signatures. We need bigger machine learning models. Maybe one day we will have large language models that can solve all the problems. Um, we can ask ChatGPT what it thinks about that. Um, we need bigger coverage. We need to make sure that all our devices are covered and secure, including our security cameras. Um, we need to be faster in response. If something happens today and it takes us until tomorrow to notify somebody that an, an attack has happened, their data might already be gone. So that's important. Things need to be cheap enough for people to afford it. Um, one of the reasons why there's no good security measures on IoT devices is because if you pay $15 for the device, you don't necessarily want to pay another 30 for the security software that's running on there. So the price does matter. Um, interpretability. You might have seen some engineers in the lab who were really happy about the complex message that they've just created to warn somebody of the bad thing that has happened. And um, well, I look at those all the time. And in fact, the messaging that we show about something that has happened needs to be understood by the person working in the response. So interpretability is a big problem as well. Of course, more context. Showing somebody that an attack has happened is not as valuable as telling them what the attack entailed, which exploits have been used, which malware has been run, which systems have been attacked, what data has been stolen, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, um, notifications with guidance would help people to respond better. And yes, again, I just presented you with my job description. This is what we do. Now a brief excursion to another specific threat, something that I found just last week. Um, the company named Cystic, they're really great in finding cloud-specific threats. If you're interested in cloud threats, Cystic puts out a lot of very good research. And one of those treated a threat named Amber Squid. I do not know how they get to those threat names. That is a mystery to me. But what was interesting about that one is it's a cloud-native crypto-checking operation. What does that mean? That basically means that somebody else breaks into your AWS account and installs Bitcoin miners. That's how they hijack the crypto mining capabilities of your compute instances. What was interesting there, and something that I've brushed on before, um, EC2 is what the instances, the compute instances and accounts typically are. If you spawn off a, a server, you get an EC2 instance. However, EC2 is not the only thing that can execute code in a cloud account. There's other products as well. And some of those um, got into focus of this specific threat actor, that being, among others, ECS, SageMaker, CloudFormation, CodeBuild, and Amplify. And in fact, there's other products in the AWS cloud that can execute code. And anything that can execute code can execute malicious code. Those attackers are very crafty. And from our perspective, that was interesting because the threat detection that's happening in the cloud, again, doesn't necessarily cover all of those products. You can very easily scan your compute instances. You can scan your storage. You might not be able to scan your build system necessarily. So this is something to catch up on. Coverage. Now finally. Let me get to the interesting part of this presentation. I talked about pattern matching a lot. Patterns, like signatures, like indicators of compromise, like threat intelligence. And then there is machine learning to solve those problems. My scientists would cringe, but in reality, machine learning is just a smarter way to find signatures and use them to detect threats. And I'm sure there's some machine scientists in the audience as well, and they start shooting tomatoes. But in reality, what we do for those algorithms is we find all the malicious patterns. We tell the algorithms, go look for those malicious patterns. And then the algorithm goes through the benign data and starts looking. And a big problem that this field of research in the industry has is that there's a big gap between research and reality. 
I myself have written a paper about malware clustering when I graduated from this school. For that project, I used approximately 200 pieces of malware and approximately six different behavior data sets that we extracted from those malware. And then we leveraged six different algorithms on those data sets. And let me tell you, 15 years later, this is not the way to do malware clustering. <laughs> you need a few more samples in the thousands, in the millions, not 200. And you need to put your data set together into one set and not use it um, in shards of six. I learned. Um, unfortunately, a lot of research that we see these days published in scientific papers, they go a very simple, uh, a very similar path as I did back then. Um, turns out the problem in itself, um, as these folk here did, I don't want to call out any specific piece of research, but I'm using this as an example. Um, they published a paper about classification of Internet of Things malware based on byte sequences from executable files. We also call those n-grams. That means we look at a file and we pick out sequences of bytes without knowing what those bytes do. We just cut the thing into pieces and use those as features for a classifying agent. There are several problems with that. Several reasons why this doesn't work in production as well as one thinks. But if we take the problem and we cut it into the right shape and size for us to solve, of course, we can produce a solution that is successful in a certain percentage of cases. That is what happens a lot in research papers. And that's a big issue for us in, in the industry to take those papers and take them to production. Very often, that's not actually possible. And we have these problems time and time again. Some of our researchers are just busy taking the research that's been published, where there's very good findings in there. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that this research is garbage. It is very useful but it does not scale. Almost none of the papers that we read and try to reproduce are directly applicable to the problems that we're looking at. Some of those gaps, some of those gaps I'll present here. First of all, research usually looks at problems that are not as ambiguous as what we see in practice. If those guys were looking at classifying IoT malware, they were most likely looking at ELF executables. Those are executables that run on Linux platforms. Those can come in many colors, and ELF executables are not the only malware that runs on an IoT platform. IoT systems usually have a fully blown operating system, and those can execute many things, not just binaries, but also scripts. And so if I start out trying to classify ELF executables, I know this from my own experience in the industry. We miss the big other field of binaries, sorry, of, of scripts that can execute and cause malicious um, activities. So in the industry, we don't get to cut our area into a practical target field. We don't get to say we only look at the alpha executables, and we don't get to say we only look at the scripts. We need to try to catch everything under the sun that can be executed on a given box. Our research problems change. In academia, we often see that, I mean, that's simply how it works. People pick a problem for a paper, and they work on that problem for six months, for a year. Then they publish the paper, and then they're done with it. Unfortunately for us, that doesn't work this way. We build a classifier today that detects threats today. And say six months down the line, the attacks change, the products change, the devices change, the operating systems change. And as such, we need to be on top of that and update our technology to catch up with those changes. And that is most of our work. We do not get to spend as much time in research as we do in trying to keep the lights on for the systems that we already have. And I already mentioned, in research, scaling is often not taken into account. Something else that we face is the lack of curated data. If you build a machine learning algorithm to detect threats, you need a lot of data some of it malicious and some of it benign. Malicious data is sparse, especially in production environments. If you want to find threats, again, you need the malicious indicators in your data set. However, attackers out there aren't nearly as productive as you would think, at least not as productive as benign software. Take, for example, you need a, a runtime trace from a running system 
to find um, that exploitation has happened. You need a significant portion of exploits being executed in that environment for that to be relevant enough to train a machine learning algorithm on it. And that is difficult because executing exploits is hard. It is not an easy thing. You just execute the thing and it works. That needs research. And as such, creating that malicious data is a lot of work for scientists. Benign data, on the other hand, often analyze restrictions. I'm pretty sure most of you have heard about GDPR. Here's some nods. Cool. Um, I have spent a lot of time looking at GDPR <laughs> because um, GDPR protects people's privacy and data, which is a good thing. That is great. Um, it might be a problem in research if you're trying to get to benign data that looks exactly like the benign data that represents your customer's environment, but you cannot access the data. That is a good thing. We do not want our customer's data. But also, we face the problem of like, where do we get that benign data from? In reality, in industry research, how that often works is you create it yourself. You set up a benign environment that gives you those benign traces where you can then execute the malicious things so that you get the malicious traces. And you sense what I'm talking about means a lot of work. There's a lot of engineers sitting out there just trying to build synthetic attacks and synthetic benign data. Yeah, and once we have all that data, it's not like we just take the data and feed it to the algorithm. That data needs to be analyzed, it needs to be prepared, it needs to be curated. That's the word we use. We try to make sure that there isn't any bias in the data, that we don't teach the algorithm something we don't want the algorithm to learn. We need to feed it exactly that data that we want the algorithm to pick up on. Third, testing on experiments gives you experimental results. If you've built synthetic benign data and you've built synthetic malicious data, you get synthetic results on your algorithm. That means that you might not always be able to test whether the thing you've built in the lab, sometimes you need to test out in the wild, in the production environment. And I'll cut this short with a list of things that we need to take into consideration if we want to scale security um, using machine learning. Um, reality, unfortunately, often looks different than it does in research. Again, our problems are ambiguous. We have adaptive conditions. Sometimes during such a project, the requirements change. The attacks might change. The benign data might change. Policies might change. GDPR might get an update, and all of a sudden, different bits of data fall off of our plate. We need to spend lots of time curating our data, and sometimes a lot of it. Again, if you want to build a large language model, you need a lot, a lot of curated data. And that data isn't always easy to find. Um, we want to remove biases in the data. Sometimes the data we use is naturally biased. And that's not always visible at first sight. So people sit there for a long time and try to figure out where those biases are and try to even them out. Um, my first uh, example for this is in malware work. If people use VirusTotal malware to build classifiers and build clustering algorithms, if you just go to VirusTotal and you download all the malware samples of the past two days, you get very, very um, homogeneous sets of malware. Because it just so happens that campaigns that spread malware are time limited, and those campaigns are usually all detected at the same time. Somebody picks up a detection for the latest denial of service bot, that detection is shared across the industry, and then everybody detects those bots. And then all those bots at the same time land in virus total. That means if we download all that malware for our classifier, all we get is denial of service bots. And I tell you this because I've been there. It is very unfortunate if you have a classifier that you build and you have an accuracy of 99.98% because your data set is screwed. So that's what you don't want to happen. Again, malicious data points are hard to come by, restrictions on benign data exist, and testing in production becomes real. And trust me, your boss is not happy if you start testing things in production. Finally, this is my last productive slide. There's something out there called flywheels. If you build security, as mentioned before in academia, sometimes you look at a problem and after six months you publish a paper and then you're done. That does not happen in the industry. This is not how scale works. 
you look at the problem, you build your solution, you roll out the solution, then you go back to the problem, you see whether the solution solved the problem. If it did, great. You go back six months later, and you see whether your solution still fixes the problem. Usually it does not. Problems change, requirements change. So you go back in your flywheel, you run in a circle, and you fix the product that you've built to adapt to the changing world around it. And the graphic on the slide was really just for entertainment purposes. All right, this was my presentation. I hope that you learned one or another thing about scaling, one another thing about security problems that we face these days, and how we can tackle those. That said, thank you for your attention. And this is a screenshot of my favorite RFC, which is called IP over avian carriers with quality of service. Thank you so much. <laughs>